the distinctive characteristics of sound or the distinctive characters of sound. And we'll be looking at three, there's a number of them, but mainly we, we'll be looking at pitch, intensity, and timbre. Um, these are important characters of sound, and the understanding of these three, uh, pitch, intensity, and timbre, is fundamental to understand the terminology, the, the why certain things function, the how sound works, but also it's fundamental to understand the equipment that we use. Remember earlier I showed you a picture of the mixer from, from my computer. In that mixer, there's no musical terms. As I said earlier, it's all scientific terms. So we, there is frequency, there is decibel. That's all you see. All the numbers are it's frequencies and decibels. So if you want to use that, you need to understand this is this stuff. So it's a bit theoretical, but uh, you have to persevere through it. So before we go there, however, let's look at the, at the following. We create an equation where we analyze or study the, 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 the variation of sound or sound level over time. So we will have time on this x, and on this one we will have air pressure level. Okay, now right now we don't give it any measurement, we just call it air pressure. Let's go back to our tuning fork. Now, do you remember earlier I, I said that sound is a per perception of uh, a vibrating object? Okay, so let's go back to that. So we got a, a vibrating object that affects the air around it, that eventually somehow triggers our ears that is connected to the brain, and we now perceive this thing. Okay, so now if we want to understand the vibrating object that affects the air, we need to study how this thing vibrates and how the air around it is affected. So to do that, we're going to slow down this thing really, really tremendously. We got this really fancy slow motion machine, which is my hand. So if we had to slow down really, really, really severely, you will look at, at this tuning fork standing still when there is no energy applied to it. So it's not vibrating standing still, okay? Very easy. Now I give it energy and it starts to vibrate. And it vibrates rather fast. In fact, when I see it vibrating, I can't even see that it's vibrating, okay? It's vibrating really fast. Now if I slow it down, I would see that when it's vibrating, it's doing this motion of movement in what is, can be defined as a Cyclical, cyclical manner. In other words, in a cycle. It forever is the same way. And what is the same way is that it's moving forward, back to the center position, backward, and then back to the center position again. It's often, um, you often, it's, it's illustrated this principle with the pendulum. You know what the pendulum is? So it, it os oscillates this way from left to right. So the center, when it's not moving, the, 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 the pendulum clock, then you go left, right, left, right, okay? Forever and ever and ever and ever, okay? It's the same principle, it's like a pendulum. So now let's quickly look at this steering fork moving, left, center, backward, forward. So it's essentially looking at four movements, from the standing position to forward movement, it's called stroke one. Then it goes back, we'll call that stroke two. Then it goes backward, stroke three, and forward again, stroke four. Okay, can you see that? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now the question is, what happened to the hair that is around it? When the, 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 the object goes forward, it compresses the hair around it. Obviously, this is in a very, very, very small sense, not in a huge sense, but it does cause the air to be compressed. So if we go back to our drawing, remember we have four strokes. Zero, then we have stroke one, sorry, one, two, three, four. So we have one, two, three, four. So at stroke one, 
the air pressure would be positive. This is negative because it's compressed and let's say it would be somewhere there. At, at the end of stroke two, the tuning fork is back to normal, meaning that the air pressure level will be back to zero. A stroke three is going in the opposite direction. How does it affect the air? It's decompress the air. So it goes in the negative part. And then at four is back to zero. Now if I join it, these dots in the fashion in which it changes over time, the air pressure level, I have our famous sinusoid. sinusoid. You obviously have done this at school, you obviously have seen this before. Okay? So um, this is air pressure level varying over time. Good? Does it that help you? So in other words, if you ever seen this, what, is it, what does it represent? It represents how does the air pressure level change over time as this thing vibrates. Okay, good. Now here, before we look into pitch, timbre, and intensity, I just would like to um, highlight some terminology so that later on we have this knowledge when we need it. Okay, so let's first look at the distance between the peak in the positive side and the bottom peak, which is this one. We will call this amplitude, which is the sum of air pressure in the negative and positive sense, but in absolute terms, not in, in, in uh, in an algebraic sense, in absolute terms. So this would be, let's say if this is 5 and this is 5, the sum is 10. It's not obviously in an algebraic sense, it's 5 and minus 5, so the sum is 0. You got it? Okay, so that's called amplitude. This part here is, is a cycle because it's the time it requires for the cycle to be completed from Position zero, which is when the, the tuning fork is still to moving forward, back to center, backwards, back to center. So this is all cycle. So we call this cycle. And when we look at this picture, we're looking at two possibilities. Other period, which we indicate with T, which is how, how long does it take for a cycle to be completed? That's the period. Or wavelength. And that is, what is the distance that the sound would have covered in that amount of time? Wavelength. So every time we look at the cycle of a sound wave, we can look at it from a time perspective or from a distance perspective. If it's time, we call it period. If it's distance, we call it wavelength. Okay? You got it. So when later I'm going to be referring to wavelength, you know what I'm talking about. Good. Okay, let's go... This information you need for all, uh, mainly for our discussion on intensity and our discussion of pitch, but you will need it for most of the stuff. That's why I thought to introduce it now before we go and speak about the thing. Now let us look at the three characters of distinctive characters of sound being pitch, intensity, and timbre. We will look today, I think we're only going to do... Um, Pitch. Okay, what is pitch? Let's quickly read what we have noted here. Now, remember earlier I said that uh, sound is made up of two different halves per perception and production. Okay, now what the, the table that I've done in your notes is done the same way. We have the name of one of the character, um, distinctive characters of sound. In the case, it would be pitch. Then we look at the perception, how we perceive this thing of pitch. And then we look at production. On which factors is this perception dependent on? You got it. So we're going to look at pitch both from a perception point of view and the production point of view. So let's quickly read. Pitch, 
the perception side of it is described as the attribute of sound that gives the impression of musical height, enabling us to arrange sounds from low to high. In other words, pitch tells us how to arrange sounds. Pitch is to sounds like uh, distances to, uh, like measuring distance. You go from short to long, in the pitch world we go from low to high. So when every time we listen to a tone or a sound, we can categorize it. Okay? You got it. So what does pitch tell us? On a perception point of view, pitch tells us what is the musical height of a specific sound. Example. Uh, let me play you some tones here. Yeah. I got a low, a mid, and a high tone. Okay, low. Then we have a mid, low, mid uh, tone. And then a high one. So what I've done just now, I have played you three different tones. Each one had a different musical height or a different pitch. Okay, you got it? Now, as, we, as I was playing them, you should have been able to see them there on the screen. I'm going to, okay, you can see that. Now, the reason why you can see that and you can even see the, my voice being dancing there on the screen is that because that is a instrument which is called a spectrograph, which analyzes the different frequencies or the different uh, tones engaged in a sound. Now, we'll get to that just now. But just, just to introduce you, my friend, uh, the spectrograph. Okay, but we'll go to it just now. Now, let's also quickly, now that I've played you the three different tones, if we have defined pitch from a perception point of view, let's look at what a pitch is dependent on, okay? Pitch is dependent on the frequency of the vibration. Do you remember the cycle? Now, what science has studied or has discovered is that every pitch or every musical height has a specific amount of cycles occurring in one second, okay? So, remember, science uh, studies things in depth, so they went to three different tones I've just played, and they thought, okay, this thing is moving. Why don't we see how many of those movements occurs in one second? Then we can understand why the low is playing low and why the high is playing high. And what they figure out is that the amount of cycles per second between different pitches varies. So this one, for instance, which I played you earlier, which is the low tone, has 100 cycles in a second. In other words, the cycle from 0 to 4 occurs 100 times in a second. And when such a vibration occurs, you have this tone. This is called 100 hertz. This pitch which gives it the perception of musical height, is measured in hertz. Hertz is the amount of cycles in a second. Okay, you got that. Then here we have the example of uh, 500 hertz, the, the mid one. This is a mid tone. How many cycles a second? 500. And the last one that I, uh, I uh, used earlier was 500. Sorry, 5,000. This is 5,000 hertz. So we had 100, 500, and 5,000. Okay? So even though it's three sounds, what differs between them is the amount of cycles that each one generates in a second. So can you see now, again, from a, the, the two sides of... of, um, of um, the language. Perception describes musical height from low to high. Science has uh, nothing to do with musical height. 
It's got to do with cycles per second. For instance, why is this important? It, I have a point. This one is a note that musicians will call A4. It's an A on the fourth octave. While science will call this a 440 hertz. So they are exactly the same, just in two different languages. Okay, you got it. So we got production, 440 hertz. Perception, A4. It's exactly the same thing. How do, so how do we measure uh, pitch? We measure pitch in hertz, which describes the amount of cycles in a second. So 400 hertz is 400 cycles in a second. Okay. The last thing I want to mention is that every single instrument uh, produces a different frequency range. And uh, to describe that, we have this picture, which is quite important to, to look at. It describes how every instrument has a different frequency range. What does it mean, a frequency range? It means that not every instrument produces all the frequencies. Before I say that, I should actually say that we as human beings uh, perceive not all the frequencies in the world. Uh, we only perceive frequencies that are between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So there is frequencies below that and there is frequencies above that. But we as human beings do not hear them. Okay? Yeah, the dogs and other animals can, the dogs hear higher and the other animals hear lower. But we will hear between 20 and 20,000. And with this, within those 20 to 20,000, every instrument covers a specific portion of the frequency range. Okay? Um, one instrument, one acoustic instrument only covers all of them, which is the organ, the pipe organ, and then the piano also has a pretty uh, big uh, frequency range. But as you can see from this paper, you can see that every instrument has a specific frequency range, meaning that not, they cannot do all the notes. And as you can observe, for instance, the flute goes from about 261 to about 2093. But for instance, note where the flute starts, the bass guitar ends, more or less, just below that. The bass guitar range ends at about 196 hertz, while the flute starts at about 260. It means that from a purely note point of view, flute and bass can never play the same notes, which is very important from a musical level and on a sound level when you mix, because they mix themselves pretty well. <laughs> yeah, because they're pretty much apart. But other instruments like um, a guitar and a cello, for instance, are very similar. A lot of the human voice are very similar. A lot of the human voices produce the same notes, which makes it more challenging to uh, accommodate them when they sing the same thing at the same time. Okay, so this is a particularly important piece of information which we will review when we speak about EQing and when we speak about mixing. What I would like you to just grasp is that different instruments produce different frequencies and therefore they need to be treated in a different way. This is very important. So, we just quickly look at the first um, distinctive, distinctive characteristic of sound, which is pitch. And just to wrap it up, pitch refers to the musical height of um, sound. It is measured in hertz, which is cycles per second. So, perception says musical, musical height, production says how many cycles in a second. It's the same thing, it's pitch, it is called the same it is the same thing, sorry, but it's called two different things. The, the tuning fork is an A4 in music and is 440 hertz in science.